Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, this is our alumni panel for the Systemic Risk Program. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for taking their time to join us. Also, the panelists uh, we have today. Um, I just wanted to also start, before we start, I um, just wanted to let you know uh, whatever the panelists say in our uh, session today is not necessarily the view of the institution that they're with. Um, so just did a little disclaimer on that. Um, so myself, my name is June. Um, I am the academic director of the MMS and Systemic Program here at Yale School of Management. Um, I, I might have talked to a lot of you guys or you, have, you might have talked to Ashley about the program, but we thought you know, this would, session would be helpful in really introducing the program and getting to know the program with, with the eyes from the eyes of the people who have gone through the program. So um, just to introduce, briefly introduce our panelists, um, we have Andrea, who is from Bank of Mexico. We have Caleb, who is currently at Yale Program on Financial Stability. And we have Junko, who is currently pursuing her PhD at the Northwestern University of Kellogg School of Management. So that's a brief introduction, but I thought I would start with that, you know, turning it over to our panelists and giving them an opportunity to really go into their backgrounds and give you a little bit more information on, you know, what they were doing when they were coming to systemic risk, why they came to systemic risk program, and also what they're doing currently, but also longer term, um, you know, what they plan to do so that, and we, we specifically picked uh, the three panelists here because you know they are pursuing very different paths, and um, you know we just wanted to give everyone a broader view of the people who come and join us at Systemic Risk. So I guess Andrea, do you want to start off and uh, take it away? Great, thank you so much, June. Thank you, Ashley, for the invitation to join this panel. Um, well, I would like to start a little bit telling you about uh, how, how was it my experience before going to the program. So I was, I had been working at that time for almost two years at the Mexican Central Bank. I was in the Directorate of Regulation and Supervision. So basically my role was a, as a non-site supervisor for microprudential regulation that was issued uh, by the Central Bank. So my main responsibility was to ensure that banks were complying with, with the regulation issued. And, and that could go into different topics, it's starting from like derivatives and FX markets to risk management practices, also governance and also consumer protection. So then um, I, I knew about the program because one of my colleagues was already studying on, on the first cohort of the program. So that, that got me like in touch with the program and I starting to do some more research about it. And so I, I, I figured out that it would be a great option for me to kind of dig into a broader scenario and trying to like get a platform where I could like uh, be in touch with different uh, central bankers and regulation, regulators from around the world. Uh, at that point, I was convinced that cross-border cooperation was like super helpful for everyone, but I didn't have like that kind of network for me to 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 interact with. So that's how how I I decided to to pursue the program and to start a little bit um, like doing more research about it. Um, and and well, I don't know if you want me to go over like uh, like why did I chose a program and okay so 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 basically for me it was like um, I started to do more research on the program and and I found out that uh, it had a world leading faculty and that the platform would be great for me to exchange views with different regulators around the world um, and moreover. What interest, interested me the most was like the curriculum that, that you had. Um, so it went over for like having a, an overview of the central banking functions, not only supervision that I, that I knew, but trying to, to know about uh, monetary policy and micro prudential policy. Um, and also what I liked about it was um, the, the GFC course that gives you like, um, like you go and study the past and trying to understand how 
an event like that uh, would impact in the in our current lives and and, and going forward. Um, so I think that was that was my my main motivation for me to pick the program, and and I was aiming to have like a like a broader scenario and and a more macro credential approach to go back to supervision. Uh, then I went back uh, almost, it was almost two and a half years ago. I came back from the program. Um, I, I stayed uh, for a year more at the, uh, at the supervision uh, functions. And then um, I think it was yeah, a year and a half ago uh, with a pandemic going on, I was able to switch to the financial stability directorate um, so right now, I mean, it's not like I can talk that much about <laughs> what is it that I do, uh, but basically it's uh, taking part at the FSB and the BIS working groups and trying to um, evaluate some of the too big to fail reforms, TLAC regulation, um, some of the effective regimes for resolution and, and, and I mean, I think going going forward, uh, how I see myself in a few years would be um, to to pursue a PhD, just as Junko is doing right now. Uh, so I'm, I, I try I'm trying to get into research, um, and I I would also love to spend a few years at the BIS, you know, working on some policy development. Great, thank you so much, Andrea, um, and then just. Uh, before we move on, um, I just I just remember that I forgot to tell everyone, uh, please post your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, we will be aggregating the questions. And then once you know we're done with everyone introducing themselves, we will uh, start delving into those questions. And we've gotten some questions that uh, beforehand, but also you know, we'll be taking real time questions also. Um, I guess, Caleb, do you wanna take, do you wanna take it away now? Yeah, you bet. Hey everyone, I'm Caleb, and uh, I was I, I started my career at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, I was in the statistics division there, uh, kind of responsible for uh, the big database that tracks where all the banks are and who owns them here in the United States. Uh, and then I did some work on reference rates uh, calculations, and it was uh, an exciting job. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, but I saw as I was working on different projects with people that were ahead of me in, in the kind of career track that I was on. Uh, and I, it was central bank operations, uh, which are interesting and fascinating in their own right. But I wanted to take a little bit of a step away from operations and towards policymaking and the, the kind of the room where policy uh, decisions are made. And so I knew that uh, an education and uh, using education to, to make that pivot would be really helpful. Um, and, you know, this uh, master's degree is a degree that is, is, is really genuinely unique. Like there's just not anything comparable. It's not like just doing a, an econ masters or, or an applied finance masters. Like it is genuinely very unique in this, kind of world of financial policy making. Uh, and so it seemed to, uh, to really fit. Uh, there's some, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll say a couple of, I'll say a bunch of great things about the program itself uh, and the master's degree itself. Um, but I will make a comment that I, I spent a couple of years working with the faculty on one of their other side, pro or one of their side projects, which is called the Yale's program on financial stability. And I, I bring that up uh, partly to say that, you know, that the faculty is, are really at the cutting edge of all of this. Not only are they either former officials or former advisors or current advisors to, to officials in, in, in central bank and, and supervisory uh, institutions around the world, uh, but they're, they're even uh, beyond, beyond just their teaching work uh, they're keeping very active in uh, in all of the current stuff and and building some cool some cool things. Uh, and so before there was a brief period or there was a couple of years actually before, between the Chicago Fed and starting the master's degree where I was working full time with the faculty uh, and and with with uh, June and Ashley on on these projects. And so it's it's cool to be uh, to be a part of that. 
Um, you know, another awesome benefit that that uh, that Andrea brought up already is just this international focus. Uh, you know, all you know, lots of countries represented in each cohort, uh, and you become a part of a, a group that is uh, you know an alumni group that extends just beyond your single class. Um, and then I guess one other kind of cool thing that I'll mention about the program itself is. Um, and I know this changes, so I'm not going to say whether it is a requirement or not, but uh, uh, I had the opportunity to work on a years long project. So where I got to work really close with faculty on something uh, that wasn't exactly related to a specific uh, class or anything. Um, and, uh, and, and that proved to be a really wonderful experience to have that kind of be able to do a full, basically, a, you know, kind of a thesis, um, but but they, they're really flexible on, on what that was and, and, and allowing us students to, to really pick something that, uh, that could have an impact and that could, uh, you know, some students actually had work that they were doing for their central bank that was a really big, cool project that the, or their regulator that wanted to do, but uh, this was a given the kind of the space uh, to do it. Uh, so when I, when I finished, I'm from the class of 2021, so I just finished uh, six months ago. Um, and I, uh, I, I, can, I went back to working on the program on financial stability here. So uh, still went back to working on these, uh, these other projects that the, that the faculty are working on. So, I mean, I guess in the, in the medium term, you know, I, I hope to be, to be doing uh, policy work at one of the financial uh, regulators or financial policy wings of the United States government. Great, thank you, Caleb. Yeah. Um, Junko, you wanna take it away? Yeah, hi everyone, uh, I'm Junko. And when I was applying, when I, I joined to the systemic risk program, I had worked at Central Bank of Japan for four and a half year. And though I had a few rotations prior to the position, most recently I was in the financial um, system and bank examination department which is in charge of doing more supervisory work. And the, the specific branch or the division I was in was in charge of discussing like Basel III regulation with like BIS. So something similar to what Andre, I, I, guess, I suppose it's something similar to what Andre was in. And though I had been rotating a few um, positions prior to joining the division as uh, a department, like the, by the time I started working for the Basel stuff, I knew this is something I wanted to do for my life. I really enjoyed thinking and working on financial stability. And um, while I was working in Bank of Japan, I had an opportunity to um, get the uh, study abroad position at Bank of Japan. And as Caleb had said, when I have this, this specific interest in financial stability, other, let's say, master's degree in the econ finance didn't necessarily suppress my interest. And I, I was looking for programs and in turn out, yeah, I had this like specific program looks like design for me. So I decided to apply it. And the greatest things I had is kind of overlapping with Carol and Andrea is a uniqueness, like how this program is made of the people who care about these topics, central banking and financial stability. And it lets us learn from the um, build up of the most recent crisis, GFC. Well, maybe after COVID, it's not the most recent crisis. But like, it was very nice for me because I particularly started working after the GFC. It was very nice for me to see the building blocks of how we got here and where we are right now and what are the things we should be thinking going forward. So that's why I chose a systemic risk and I got exactly what I wanted through the systemic risk. And other things I would mention is a very close community of the systemic risk because mostly the cohort is around 10, 10 people or like, like around that number, you become very close to your cohort and the, with the faculty. So that was great. Um, touching on what I'm doing after the program is because I was so fascinated by the systemic risk program, I became aware that what I wanted to pursue is like studying the very long-term impact of this financial stability with the real economy. And thinking a bit about that, I realized that like getting a PhD and studying that subject, becoming a researcher is one of the way um, 
on the path I wanted to take. And um, though my long-term plan, what to do after I get PhD is still undecided, but I definitely want to contribute back to the policy world, uh, maybe through research, maybe through the direct policy implementation, but that's my plan for now. Well, thank you everyone for the great introduction. Um, so I guess, you know, now we can kind of go through the questions that we got and really get into your experiences of the Yale SOM and systemic risk. So um, we're getting some questions in the question board, but um, I'm, I will combine them with some of the relevant questions that we have already got. So I guess the first question that we can kind of attack is that, you know, uh, what are your kind of favorite elective courses or required course classes that you have taken in systemic risk and why? Um, I think one of the uh, one of the real uh, the question board that we got is uh, asking about, you know, what electives do you recommend? So I think we can kind of combine those two questions. Um, and then in talking about those like courses and studying, uh, one of the questions that we just got is also, could you tell us about the study hours that you put in per week during the program? So um, I can see Junko smiling. Uh, so Junko, do you wanna, do you wanna take it away first? Sure. Um... So I think the great thing about this program is that it has a flexibility to take any electives, um, not only within SOM, but also within the entire um, Yale University. Um, so I would mention one of the electives that was my favorite from the SOM was speculation and hedging from Professor Stefano Giglio. It teaches the foundation how the option works and how the volatility is impacting the macro um, how do you say the overall like uh, the capital market and how we should be interpreting for that and even though the course was not designed like was more designed for practitioners I learned a lot about the mechanism how the capital market um, interact with the um, systemic risk so that was one of my favorite course and other things I would like to touch is like I started maybe doing the path of doing PhD in late um, autumn or winter when I was in the systemic risk. And thanks to the flexibility of electives, I could take a few math courses, econ courses to make me prepared for uh, doing PhD. So I, I know that doing PhD is not the how the, uh, this program is designed, but I, I, I'm really thankful for the um, flexibility the pro program ha had had to uh, to um, how do you say narrow the gap I had before joining the PhD. Oh, and the study hours. Um, it depends. Um, many of the um, systemic risk coursework depends on papers, so you can spend infinite amount. Indeed, I had a few nights. I just like kept on writing papers and papers um, on central banking topics, and it's actually really fun because, uh, as I mentioned prior. The cohort is made up of the people who also care about central banking and financial stability. So they're also happy to stay long time on the campus discussing the topics and writing papers and enjoying, you know, night snacks with you too. And that becomes a bonding. So it was a lot of work because I wanted to put lots of work, but it was definitely worth it. Thank you, Junko. Um, Andrea, do you want to take it? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, as Junko already said, it, it's great that, that Yale offers you that possibility for you to take a lot of, of, of electives as much as you can take. Um, so for me, it was, I think, behavioral finance and, well, starting behavioral finance because it has gained so much importance nowadays um, to kind of get to know what other um, issues impact uh, investors decisions or or not only apply to investors but all actors in the financial system um so i think that was mainly my motivation for me to 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 pick that that elective and also as well uh, uh an elective that it's encouraged for for systemic risk uh program to take it's apply quantitative analysis and i think that one i like even though it's like the basics that you need to know um, to kind of do some data analysis. Uh, I think what, what makes it so valuable, it's, it's the professor, Justin Thomas. Uh, he's just great. I like 
he will give you um, a lot of, of insights and he makes it so fun uh, to, to take that course. And I think it wasn't just that. For me, in my case, um, I also audit uh, some courses, as Junko already mentioned. I also took speculation and hedging, and I think it was really, really useful for me. And also, I, I took another course, which wasn't uh, from SOM, but from um, another another school. And it was about anti-money laundering and, and counter of, um, terrorism. So I think that was so useful for me as my role as a regulator, even though the Mexican Central Bank, it's not fully in charge of, of regulation for, for AML, it was really useful for me to understand the dynamics and, and, and the impact of it. Oh, and the study hours, Andrea? <laughs> oh, yeah, the study hours, well, as Junko already said, uh, I mean, you could... I mean, I spent a lot of nights at SOM just like working on, on papers and, and, and I would just like wake up there and go to communication center to keep like checking my papers. So um, I think it depends on how much hours you want to put and how you manage your time. But for me, I think I was, I was pretty much time studying, even though I tried to spare some time <laughs> to other activities. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it would be endless the hours. Thank you, <laughs> Caleb. Uh, so my uh, electives, I ended up going kind of in a slightly different direction um, in that I, I uh, chose to do classes that would try and kind of balance me out and or, or expose me to other stuff that uh, I, I might not have gotten if it wasn't specifically for, you know, being at Yale. And so I took uh, the first elective I took was a was a class on urban poverty, uh, and was how kind of fiscal policy because like the, the program is obviously very heavy on on monetary policy, macro prudential stuff. Um, uh, but we, you know, you don't you're not going to get any like tax policy or or stuff like that uh, in in the in the program itself. And so I wanted just a little bit just a little bit of that. Uh, so I was able to do that through this elective, um, you know, really innovative course uh, that uh, by uh, Professor Kate Cooney that I really liked. And then in the spring, uh, I took an entrepreneurship class, um, which I, uh, which was really fun and, and was really interesting and something that, you know, entrepreneurship has become, you know, even when I was at the Chicago Fed, uh, it was something that they were encouraging and even these old, you know, central banks are not known for being entrepreneurial, uh, but they, you know, partly because of the crises of 08 and COVID and just uh, all, you know, debt stuff, there's like, there's, there is this need of like being creative and stuff. And so uh, I, I wanted to see if I could, could learn a few things, uh, pick up at least a few things from that. Uh, so, so I really uh, enjoyed those. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, there are, there are a, a, a huge number of really awesome classes that are available. So it's definitely hard. It's hard to pick because there are so many cool, uh, cool options. Um, and then, you know, study time, I guess, in addition, I will comment about, add one comment about the papers. You know, it's really interesting because it's, you're writing, I, I really like the style of papers that are asked of the systemic risk students, which are mostly like memo style. Uh, and so although they're not, you know, just like, you're not just creating side decks and you're, you're not, you know, those aren't the deliverables uh, or, or just little bulleted lists of stuff, um, but you are, you know, you're not required every week to write 30 pages or something where you're just cranking stuff out. Like, it's very cool because the, the, the work that you're asked to do and the stuff that you're expected to write is as if you were, you know, kind of advising a senior policymaker or a, a decision maker, a governor or or a leader, you know, who says, you know, hey, uh, we, we've got this problem coming in, you know, I need a memo on it in by tomorrow or in a couple of days. And you have more time than that, obviously, but that's like the spirit of the assignments. And so they feel very real, you know, they feel very practical uh, and, uh, and very cool. And so then, you know, there's, uh, there's just, you know, if you're coming to this program, the, the reading assignments are going, the, the papers and the, uh, and, and, the uh, and the books and, and all of this stuff is, is, are things that you would be reading in your job. 
uh, or would be exposed to or you're you're interested in and so it then just becomes an issue of like I, I wish I could just read every word of every of every paper that I'm assigned but you just end up uh, you know picking what you what you need and what you can do within but uh, I guess the last thing I'll say about the study time is it's it's a nine month program and so you know it's it's a one year it's a one year deal uh, and so the the like burnout that you felt in undergrad <laughs> isn't isn't something really that you'll that you'll get right like it goes by quick like you, you have time to really dump in really dive and really you know just fully immerse yourself uh and then you get you know pushed back out into the world to, to do it again so uh so I, I although you're excited as the as the end draws so that you have a little bit more free time you're still it's it's totally doable and uh and and i think uh just yeah it's it's manageable I did it with two children, so you guys, anybody can do it. <laughs> Thank you, Caleb. Uh, so just, I just wanted to briefly kind of uh, answer one of the questions that we got in the Q&A session on, are there any restrictions in terms of completing the number of minimum credits per semester? So this is more kind of uh, academic policy. So I'll just briefly answer this is that, um, there are restrictions where, um, you know, we do require people to, if they're choosing their electives, we do require them to choose between statistics, finance, and econ, um, just because that is kind of the basis of, you know, what you will be needing when you go back to central banks or when you are pursuing your career in financial stability. But uh, as Junko said, there is some flexibility. So, um, you know, when you are thinking about PhD programs in the future, uh, we do help you to kind of find the right programs. And we do have the flexibility, fle flexibility to tell you that, you know, whatever math, uh, math course that you need to take for your preparation for the PhD program satisfies the finance depth, statistics and econ requirement for the electives. Um, as far as the, uh, the ceiling of how many classes that you can take, there are no ceilings, technically. Uh, you can take as much as you want, but uh, the registrar's office will keep an eye on you because they do not want students failing out because they're overburdening themselves. So then they will send me an email saying that, hey, can you um, just kind of talk to this person who has registered, um, you know, like, like over a, a, a lot of credits um, and then, you know, we'll talk about it. And if, if I feel, and if the student feels comfortable about completing all that, then, you know, we're not gonna restrict you from doing that. So the only restriction is really kind of your personal um, ability and cap capacity to do all the work. So, so that's the, um, that's the answer to that question. Um, so the next question, I guess, kind of continuing with this, theme of, because Caleb, you mentioned a little bit about your research and thesis component. And yes, it did change as Caleb mentioned that um, I think Andrea, when you were with us, this was one of the requirements that you had to do as a part of the colloquium uh, where everyone had to finish a thesis or research component. But uh, we have decided after Andrea's year, uh, you know, that making a, a requirement is not really a great idea because some people come with a, come to us having a research project that they need to do. Some people just come and they just really want to immerse themselves in the courses. And you know, nine months is really not that long of a time to think of a research project and finish it in a meaningful way if you don't already have something that you need to do. So we have now turned that into an optional thing where, you know, like Caleb had a really amazing uh, research project that he already had started on his own and he had a co-author and collaborator. And when he told us that he wanted to finish that while he's doing the, um, the systemic risk program, um, you know, we told him that absolutely. And then he got to present that as a part of the colloquium. And then Junko, um, I think by the time you came along, this was not a requirement. So Junko, I don't think Junko did the research component. So I guess, Caleb, do you wanna go a little bit more into what your research looked like and what, how you kind of came, up, came about the idea? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I am my, like within this world that we're all, that we're all in, I have a particular interest in the, the governance issues of central banks and the, 
uh, decisions about how they're how they're structured, how they're organized, and how that affects the decisions that they make. And within the Federal Reserve System, uh, nothing is more interesting and and bizarre than the the directors of the Federal Reserve banks. And so we've got these twelve reserve banks. We're not just one institution, and uh, and it's led by this this board of directors that kind of looks like a corporate board, but kind of doesn't look like a corporate board. Um, has some. Uh, comparisons maybe to the board of a private equity uh, portfolio company, uh, where they have oversight from the from the head office in Washington. Anyways, there's lots of interesting, strange things about it, and and so uh, I uh, wanted to do more research about who these people were, and who these directors were, and and kind of what their backgrounds were, uh, what the measures of diversity were for these groups. Uh, and the summer before I started the program, as I was digging around, I was surprised to find that I that there was not a database of all of the Federal Reserve directors. And so that so basically in the fall, uh, the, a big part of this this research project was was grunt work, building this database, going back all the way to 1914 when the reserve banks were were founded. Uh, and I, I cataloged every single director. And then I, I expanded out on biographical information. So everything from race, gender, education, age, geography, all sorts of different measures. And then from that, uh, 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 like June mentioned, I was able to find just some really, it just, it just built this really rich, interesting database about these very important people uh, within the Federal Reserve System. And so from there, I was able to connect with a professor at Wharton, Peter Conti Brown, and uh, and write a, a paper, and there are actually multiple papers in the works right now based on this database, but we've published one so far um, at Brookings uh, that was just kind of an introduction to uh, who these directors were. So it was very cool because I had, well, I, you know, it was many hours, many, 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 many hours on both stages, right? On the data collection side, which as you can imagine, building database with 2,500-ish people and all of their biographical information over 100 years, like it was a lot of work. Um, and then also the writing and the analyzing the data and trying to tell a story about, about why this matters. Um, I had help from the faculty at, uh, within the program and with, from people like June and Ashley and, and Alex um, in, in each of those stages, whether it's connecting to how do I find this type of data? How do I, uh, and then, you know, what kind of story should I be telling and what does this mean? And so the faculty, I met with them uh, at least once a month uh, the faculty about about how it was going and if I had the right resources and you know they'd help me connect to people if I if I needed to to connect to people to find that information um, so I found it a very valuable very very valuable uh, experience um, but June is absolutely right uh, that if you you kind of need to come into the program with an idea or at least a general idea and you decide really quickly because although you will be given time to to work on that kind of stuff like you can you can do it uh you know the program goes by quick and so you want to you want to start uh, as soon as possible thank you caleb and andrea i don't know if you want to add a little bit about your experience it's a it's slightly different since you know you were it was a part of the requirement and you were kind of forced to do it but um because but i remember your project so uh do you want to talk a little bit about yours yeah so so in my case, I mean, yeah, as you said, it was part of a requirement. Back then I was in supervision, so I, I wasn't that much into research. Um, I didn't have like a topic thought that well. Um, so I kind of uh, started like analyzing some, some options. And what was good about it is that we were working together with uh, three of my classmates and we were working on what was the impact of uh, financial inclusion in financial stability and some kind of what happened also in terms of um, like this FinTech world and how that would also help to promote financial stability. Um, I mean, it was something that we wanted for it to, to be a paper to be published, but uh, like we didn't have enough time to go into that. And then we, we were thinking to work on that once we went back to our countries, but I mean, life happened, so we haven't had the time to, to manage to do that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's really good. Like if you have 
if you have an interest in research, it's good for you to have already like a like a, a topic thought and try to work and take advantage of the of the of the faculty that you have there and all the resources that, that Yale offers. And if I can just add one thing so, uh, to people, if you if you do get in and you are interested, so this is, you're in a kind of a sweet spot because you don't you won't have to do a, a, a year long research project, but it's a conversation you can have before you leave your institution uh, with your with your bosses and with your bosses bosses and or with somebody from a different department that you're interested in and just say and you can just approach them and say like hey you know I'll have nine months. It's more than a probably internal project. I'd be able to have time to work on it if I was still an employee. Um, but you know, are, do you have ideas of stuff that I could do? I know there have been students that have have worked on stuff uh, that uh, was internal to the institution, and they they were using you know internal data that they weren't able to share too too much with us uh, with their coworkers. But uh, you know, they were able to do that as well. So it's kind of the that uh, as Andrea was talking, that came to mind as well as a kind of the little piece of advice when you get in. And if you decide you don't want to take any of their advice, you don't have to, <laughs> I guess, from the systemic risk side. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Andrea and Caleb. So I think that's a great leeway since Caleb was talking about, um, you know, what you do, what you're thinking about as, as you're admitted. Um, I think we're, we have a question here that talks, uh, asks us, you know, do you need to study in advance any subject or preparatory courses before joining the course? Um, just, just to give um, everyone what we started doing a couple years ago, realizing that, you know, we are getting a lot of these questions is that um, I, I started kind of compi compiling informal lists from all of our alumni on kind of suggested readings, um, you know, and this is not really anything that's very technical, but more about kind of the books that uh, a lot of our alumni found really helpful before starting the, um, the systemic risk program. So I, I started circulating that to our admitted student, you know, class once, you know, things kind of are finalized and around like summer, right before you, um, everyone comes in. But, you know, it would be really nice to hear from you individually what the top things that you thought would be kind of helpful for people to think about before joining the systemic risk program. So um, Junko, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, so like adding kind of adding on to what Jane had mentioned, a lot of the courses, especially the class of macro prudential policy, we'll talk about the international comparison of the regulation we have. So I personally thought it would have been useful if I learned a little bit more of like how my own country's regulatory system has been implemented, designed, and how the uh, and how like maybe in the greater geographical form, like let's say um, Asia, Europe, the United States has been operating, and what has been the, like the recent um, discussion topics, uh, which some of the bits you can kind of see from like official speech from the central bank, so the BIS speech, uh, that would have been extra helpful if I had read a little bit more prior to starting the program. But like knowing about your own country would definitely make you able to contribute to the discussion in the classes. Thank you. Andrea. Uh, yeah, I think I agree with Junko. I mean, I, I was involved in the regulatory side, so it wasn't that big of a deal, but I think there, there were still some particular things that would be helpful for me to know uh, more. And, and mostly because I knew the regulation of the central bank, but I wasn't that much um, involved in the regulation from other authorities in Mexico. Uh, so that would be helpful. But yeah, I think I think once I left the program, I, I had a, a coffee talk with you, Joan, and we started like uh, listing those books. And, and I think, mostly like central banking uh, books and and I think also the books that are read uh, for the GFC class are like uh, super helpful for you to read it in, in advance um, because yeah it's a lot it's a lot and you don't have that much time and you also have like more papers that you have to be reading so I think I think that with that list that you have compiled that would be uh, more than enough. Thank you. Caleb? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're coming from an institution, yeah, you're going to have a level of understanding or, or you know, you're going to have the kind of basic background. But I will add that, you know, keeping tabs on, you know, things like uh, the Wall Street Journals, the their central bank reporter. In fact, actually, you know, the the list of Fed reporters uh, is not like super long. You know, there are maybe like between between like 15 and 25 um, Fed reporters. And so it's, it's actually not hard to, to, to be able to follow everybody that's reporting on, on the US side. So if you're, if you're nervous about coming to a US institution uh, and not having a ton of familiarity, familiarity with it, um, you know, that's, I think that's probably the, the, the best place to start is just keeping tabs on what's happening right now. And then, you know, as you're reading, just look up terms that you don't know or institutions that you don't know. So that would kind of, that's kind of like the first half of my advice. And, and I, I'll, I can share that list of the kind of Fed reporters who to follow on Twitter and stuff. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, I, I would have I have to recommend uh, David Beckworth's podcast. Uh, it's called Macro Musings, and uh, although it's about the broader macro economy, it's like at least four out of five episodes touch financial stability, central banking, monetary policy, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's it is very uh, it is very relevant and and and, and topical. Um, but uh, so those are kind of all fun things. But you could also come if you make it into the program then you're like good and so like you don't like have to like you know if you don't do all of this stuff and you just show up from wherever you come if you've gotten in then you're gonna be okay so you don't need to like panic or or, or anything like that yeah thank you um yeah i i think we don't really have a specific like course that everyone needs to take i think you know in a very rare instance maybe like one or two per year in class, um, you know, Ashley and I might ask you to do a math camp that is provided by the Yale SOM um, that is a part of the orientation, but it's just, it's mostly for people who, you know, don't, might not have a finance background or a, a, a not, not a graduate level finance background, but like an undergrad finance background. Um, but, you know, I, I think, that is probably more than enough. And um, as as Caleb said, uh, we do you know ensure that everyone who comes in is very much well prepared as as you know technically wise, very well prepared um, in taking classes at Yale SOM. So um, all right. Um, and then we have another question here, continuing on with the content. You know, are there anything available, opportunities, workshops available to learn how to leverage the resources being developed by Yale Program and Financial Stability? So kind of, um, you know, I guess we can also think about um, the opportunities of our students being able to participate in the new budget project, the case writing, and then in reverse, I guess, you know, the case writing kind of informing the systemic risk program, which our panelists might not be as familiar with, but um, we are developing, we do, we are introducing a new course this semester or this year that um, Andrew Metric will be teaching, Professor Andrew Metric will be teaching. And that is going to be a half semester course in the spring where it is fully reliant on the materials developed through new budget project. So that way is, you know, that thing starting this year, we have now, enough materials to kind of, you know, start a course on it. So it will be a uh, opportunity for the systemic risk students to really learn about what the new budget project was developing and what the materials kind of look like and what we're trying to achieve for the policymakers. But I guess our panelists can really think about and talk about, you know, kind of the reverse experience where they had the opportunity to kind of participate or um, learn more about the Yale program and financial uh, stability program and kind of partner. Um, so I guess, Caleb, you're a little bit of an exception in a way you came from the Yale program on financial stability. So you probably took a little bit of a break from uh, working for, for YPFS. Um, but uh, do you want to start and just kind of give a brief answer? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I guess I'd start by saying there are, you know, between similar size, between like 10 and 15 research associates that are uh, working on the Yale program on financial stability. And so, uh, you know, you kind of have the, the systemic risk students and then the YPFS, uh, the Yale program on financial stability research associates uh, doing very, in very similar uh, types of work, just ones in a master's program and and, and one is, uh, is very dedicated on a project. And so uh, I think there, you know, there are opportunities to, to, to mix and mingle like socially, as well as, uh, you know, uh, get to know who these people are. They're, all of us are interested in this, in the same type of, uh, type of thing. So I'd say that on the, on the personal level. And then I guess I'll just give one example of the kind of work or getting like actually involved you know, the, the research associates at the program on financial stability are, are, are almost always, not, all, not always, but almost always they're, they're US folks. So they're folks with a background from the United States. Uh, so if it's like, you know, if it's like 90% US RAs in the program on financial stability, it's like 90% international in the master's program. And uh, the, the, the writing that the program on financial stability is doing is often international. And so there are, I think, the often the most productive and, and, and interesting collaborations are when uh, somebody that's in the systemic risk program ends up helping a research associate that's writing a case about their country. Um, and it ends up normally being a really productive and fun and interesting relationship. Uh, the systemic risk student may not necessarily know exactly what happened in the 1965 crisis of their home country, uh, but they have connections and they have resources, they read the language. Uh, and so that's just, that's one example that, that I'd share is, is a, you know, somebody, a, a student helping an, a, a, a YPFS write a case from their home country. Yeah, I think on that note, I think Andrea, you, I think you were very early, early on and kind of asking about uh, the YPFS cases. And I know we talked a little bit about kind of collaborating at some point. Um, and I think, I think, you know, I've had, I've requested like a review of one of the cases from Mexico for, uh, from you, but um, do you want to just kind of quickly talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, when I got into the program, I found out about the YPFS and, and yeah, I remember you told us about, about it um, in, a, in the financial stability regulation course. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I tried to, to look into the, they, they were already developing, or I think you had fully developed most of the Mexican cases. So I think it was more of a, of a review um, and back then, I think they have a, a research assistant that was from Mexico. So I think that made it easier. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I assume also that as an alumni, it's also helpful. I mean, I would be really interested in, in working in cases right now that I'm back at, at Central Bank. And I think that that's also another resource that you can also like get insights with, from within the central bank and, and trying to um, enrich these cases. Thank you. And then Junko? Yeah, echoing to like what Caleb and Andrea had mentioned, I think the unique connections of like between the research associates who are also interested in financial stability and us coming from, from the central banks is a great benefit. Um, and also because um, many of the cases after they had been working on, I, I don't know the prior, uh, the present state, but they had been working on when I was in the um, program was mostly based on the historical cases, which I often didn't have time to learn about. So being able to read, comment, and discuss about the, um, the past cases, and that, that was very beneficial. And because central bankers may have certain perspective to think in very central banking conservative ways and talking to like research associates or the editors who may not necessarily have the central banking background actually made me feel like expanding the knowledge and the ways of thinking about regulatory system. So. Great, thank you. 
So I think that is pretty much all about kind of the content of the program and the very kind of courses and everything. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of people are really curious about the life in New Haven and what it's like to be a student at Yale SOM. Um, and I know with Caleb, Caleb came in and he was the class when the COVID shutdown happened or the sh shutdown happened when Junko was in second semester. But then uh, <laughs> Caleb came in and it was kind of, you know, a lot of it was very much remote. So it was I think harder for Caleb to really think about the Yale SOM community. Um, but I think, you know, I think a lot of people are really curious about, you know, what your experience was, um, you know, kind of being a part of Yale SOM. And also Caleb, kind of your experience about uh, being a part of Yale SOM during COVID and taking class classes during COVID when, you know, a lot of the things I think in the fall semester were all remote. Um, all the classes were pretty much remote, although the students were allowed on campus and in classrooms. So um, I think, you know, that's one of the, a lot of the things that prospective students or applicants might be interested in. Um, so Andrea, do you want to kind of start off? Because you had the most traditional, <laughs> you know, SOM experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, Yale SOM has a lot of things to offer, not only uh, within the systemic risk program. Sometimes I think it's it's hard. I mean, what I what I saw in my cohort was that uh, we were just coming in to study after a few years of not studying. So getting involved kind of takes uh, some time uh, and try to manage like courses and some other stuff. It's a little bit hard. So I think I was at my at my cohort, I was most, I think the only one that got involved into a lot of stuff other than the program itself. Um, I was part of the Association of Latin American Students. So we, we were doing a lot of events and stuff like that to try to promote the culture. Um, also, I was part of the student government for one term. Um, so I was involved in the activities of, of SOM. Um, also, I, I tried as much as I could to go to the closing bells every Thursday, but it wasn't that much possible because of the, of the assignments. Um, other than that, I think SOM community, uh, it, it's great. It's, it's really good for you not to only be with, it was really helpful for me not only to be with the systemic risk uh, cohort, but also to take courses with people from other uh, programs. So that could also like give me another view or trying to um, know about different topics other than systemic risk. Um, and I think that was one of my key takeaways of my Yale experience, being able to, to have this connections with other people and, and, and having friendships from there. Um, so, so I think the community is really good. Uh, the school has a lot of things to offer, but it, it only takes for you to, to manage your time and, and being able to get involved and, and want to get involved in different activities. Thank you. And moving on to Junko, who had half of real experience and half of the COVID experience. Yeah, um, starting from the COVID part. So even though things did move on to like online in the latter half of spring semester, Yale SLM was putting lots of efforts to do whatever over Zoom possible, like Zoom over like graduation parties, the Zoom over, I don't know, just like coffee chat and everything. So they were trying their best. Caleb can talk more about it. Um, talking about the time when things were non-COVID, um, I think as Andre has mentioned, there are many social opportunities and there's every bit, like everything for like everyone, like depending on how much time and commitment you have. And so closing bells are the things like Andre briefly mentioned. It's a it's a kind of like communicate like how it's a social event every Thursday or Friday with drinks and little snacks and you can mingle with your like friends including MBAs and like systemic risk and other programs which was the best way for me to connect to people and like maybe get to know people there and go go to hiking together on like the next day with the things I used to do. Um, talking about more a little bit academic <laughs> exposure in the Yale SOM, I, I was I really benefited from being able to attend to 
finance lunch seminars um, offered in like Yale SOM, which made me to like learn a little bit more about the academic side of what discussion is going on. I also had opportunity to like meet a mentor, a, P, a, P, a female PhD student who is also interested in financial stability. So there are many ways for you to connect to the broader SOM and like think about your life and think about your, your career from various perspectives. Thank you, and Caleb on the on the COVID experience. Yeah, so yeah, my full year in COVID. Um, I'll add just one quick thing. Just although I wasn't a student, I was here for the two years before, and so the only other thing I'd add to that is there is cool stuff happening related to our work, but in other schools. So like at, in like the law school, there are events and conferences and stuff that are that are often really cool as well uh, that you can, you know, there again, like, uh, like Andrea said, and, and Junko, that you can drop in and out of based on your availability. So there's just Yale, the name is just so big. And there are so many people that are alum that are in now powerful positions that it just becomes this really cool crossroads of of just really fascinating interesting people um on all sides of the spectrum um which is which is just great uh covid um yeah so like 95 percent of my classwork or classes were done remotely um and the professor you know i think uh you know and having spoken to some of the professors as well, uh, I think by the time it had rolled down to me, they had a flow. I, you know, Junko probably had a lot of technical issues and and lots of you know issues with it, all sorts of stuff like that. By the time I had rolled, rolled around, uh, everybody knew what the drill was. All, I, in fact, I think in the entire year, there was only one time that we that Zoom went down and we weren't able to um, to go down uh, have class. And so literally the whole time, so like surprisingly, there weren't tech, as many technical issues as I anticipated. Um, and so that was good. And, you know, they, they did their best to, to, uh, to still keep us, you know, engaged and interested with each other. Um, we even, once it was permitted uh, by the school, we even had some in-person events outside. We had some picnics outside. I think the first time we didn't even eat though, because we weren't, that hadn't been approved. So we all had masks on outside, but it was like, we were, they were trying really hard to, to get everybody here uh, to New Haven and to, to kind of try and, and keep it, uh, you know, to the cohort. So you can still get that kind of social aspect, but it was definitely harder. Um, and uh, having been around, I'm, I'm still in the New Haven area and having been around, you know, it's, uh, it's it's better to be in in person and uh, the people are it's fun to see them even now and because I think there are a lot of questions about what is it going to be like or what is it like now and we don't have a, a student on the panel that's in the class today uh, but and, and these can change at any time but you know but they're doing all their classes in person they all have to be masked and, and vaccine vaccinated but they're but they are doing it in in person and and uh, and so you know you can count on this on, on them you know, really working to, to make it as, as much as possible. Now, I, I don't, uh, do you want to talk about New Haven real quick? Um, I don't know if we talked too much about that or go ahead and. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I just realized that it's all already 10. Oh, so, 10. I, but I, I wanted to address the last question we have on the, on the question board that we got. So, um, yeah, I mean, if anyone has questions about New Haven, you know, feel free to reach out like to me, since I think everyone probably has my number, but then I can connect you guys to Junko, Caleb or Andrea, and they can tell you all about it. Uh, but I think the last question is, I think this is a very quick question that you guys can answer. It's like, um, so, um, you know, you know, on our website, how like the, the living expenses is an estimate that is put on. So that's an estimate that is not done by you know, that done very lightly, but it's kind of based on everyone's experience uh, or all around Yale. So the calculation is done through central Yale with their feedback from, you know, various places within Yale who deal with student life. Uh, but the question is like, did you find that estimate a, uh, an accurate estimate or an inaccurate estimate from a student's perspective? Uh, so I guess, uh, Junko, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so the living expense um, became was I could manage myself into like less amount than I had expected. Um, I don't really remember the exact amount of it on the website, but I was pretty much surprised how much I could save. It also depends on your lifestyle. Like if you want to eat out often, it's going to be difficult. 
But uh, one of the, like, the fun tips I would give to the student is that there are lots of free food in school once it becomes in person. And I took the full benefit of that when I was, <laughs> I was a student and everything was in person. So that is a way that like, you can save some of the money. Um, also like living, there are many living options. I know some people stayed in the um, college house. I know some people were doing room sharing and there are just tons of opportunities around New Haven that uh, you can meet to your budget. So maybe those are the two tips I would have to manage your budget. Um, Andrea? Yeah, I think as Junko said, it's, it, it depends on your lifestyle and how, how do you want to, to live. Um, in my case, I was used to, uh, I had roommates back in Mexico, so I was okay to have roommates back then. But I think the estimate, it's, it's perfect for you to, like you could even have a place of your own and that would be perfect with the, the estimate that it's posted on the website. So I know Caleb, it's slightly different for you because you have family and everything, but yeah. I guess it's kind of trying to minus out the family expenses. Yeah, so yeah, so it's like, yeah, I have I had no idea what the estimate, I didn't even know there was an estimate because that wasn't in any of my calculus and it probably wouldn't have applied. Um, so I'll just say real quick, uh, if you are with a family and if you by chance, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one uh and at least i think there was one in my class that was going to bring his family and then covid messed kind of messed it yeah. up but, but so like if somebody listening does happen to want to bring the family and wants to chat with that offline i'm happy to do that um the only like i guess general advice i'd have is uh it's uh, yale has a pretty good shuttle system a pretty decent shuttle system uh but uh like general transportation is not like super great and so you know living closer to the school of management is advisable uh as 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 best you can um and then the only like other weird thing i'll say is uh east rock which is the neighborhood that's closest to the school of management the neighborhood the school of management is in doesn't have a real grocery store <laughs> they have like some like bougie uh you know like an orange is three dollars kind of uh kind of grocery markets uh and so i know people many most don't have cars when they come and so there are things like Zipcar or uber or or often you know yeah i mean i think some even in my class they would rent a car for one day like every two weeks and then all of them would pile in and drive down to trader joe's or or whatever uh so, I don't know, those two random thoughts <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's great. And obviously, um, you know, if you have any more questions, feel free to contact Ashley and me, and then we'll, we'll pass on the questions to Andrea, Caleb, and Junko. Um, and thank you, everyone, Andrea, Caleb, and Junko for joining. Um, I know you guys have busy lives and really, really thank you a lot for joining us for this. This was really helpful. And thank you, everyone who's, um, who's listening in for joining. Um, Hopefully we'll have another event like this um, in the new year. Thank you.